Okay, I'm going to close my, my chat window so I can see everybody for right now here. All right, hello, everyone. <coughs> my name is Gunnar Reisel. I'm Executive Director of uh, CSSA. Uh, our webinar series is made possible through your generous donations. Uh, you may want to consider becoming a member. We have something for everyone. If you are a beginner, if you are an experienced hobbyist grower or professional, uh, there's always something that uh, we have to offer, and uh, we'd, we would like to have you become a member. Uh, you can do that by visiting our website, cactusandsucklingsociety.org, and uh, uh, just check it out, and uh, we'd be glad to have you. All right. Uh, our first things first, our speaker in two weeks is Attila uh, Capitani. He is going to be from uh, coming from us uh, from Australia here, and his topic is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be talking about ant plants. If you're unfamiliar with ant plants, this will be a good introduction to you. And he's written several books on ant plants, so it'll, it'll be good. All right, let me introduce our panel today. Uh, from my, on my left there is, is Irvin Lightstone. Irvin, hello, uh, from the Dallas area here. Uh, then uh, moving around here, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, Jackson. You know Hi. Jackson, he's one of our regulars here from... Uh, uh, you're from Littleton too, aren't you? Littleton? I am. Okay, so we have two people. We have Rod Haney, one of our board members, vice president of CSA, uh, from Littleton as well here. Uh, going down the list here, we have uh, James Lemos. James, uh, welcome. And uh, James is from, I would say LA. Can I say Los Angeles? That's, that's, it's closer than, than if I say Altadena, nobody knows where that is, but people know where LA is, right? Yeah, a little bit north of LA. A little bit north north of LA here. Uh, we have uh, welcome back Steve Brack. Steve. Um, hello everyone. Back from, uh, from your trip to, uh, to Big Bend, right? Right. Uh, uh, I understand it's, it's a very successful trip here. Steve is the founder and uh, former owner of the Mesa Gardens in uh, New Mexico, one known nursery here. Uh, we're joined today by, by Petra uh, uh, Christ. Uh, hello, Petra. Hi, everybody. Okay. Petra is, she has a nursery called uh, uh, Rare Succulents in, in Rainbow, California, uh, well known in the California area for, as an as a, as a excellent grower here. And I think, we've, I think we've talked to her, at least we hope we've talked to her about being a regular a panelist for, for us here. So welcome aboard. I'm, I'm glad to have you here and it'll be, you're, you're going to be a wonderful addition uh, to, uh, to our, our group here. And then, of course, our speaker today. Uh, Steve Hammer. Uh, good morning, Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good, good to see you, of course. So we've been chatting for a little while here, but, but chatting a little bit about music as well. So uh, we'll stop. We'll stop that nonsense pretty soon. All right. Uh, so a little bit about the, before we start, a little bit about Stephen. Stephen is a member of Sphere Institute in Vista, California. Uh, his nursery really is renowned. It's almost, it's, I would say it's ground zero for Masem collectors all over the world. People visit him from all over the world here, and it's kind of a destination. And, uh, and I, I think we're very happy to have him be here, of course. Uh, he's got an extensive collection, second collection, and uh, people see him not only for his collection, but also for his personal charm and certainly for his knowledge as well here. Uh, as we said before, one of his other talents is that he is a an accomplished pianist, and uh, uh, we're, we're we're glad that you you know that you came to our side here. But I'm sure you would have made a, a wonderful career out of being a pianist as well here. Uh, Stephen has had extensive travels in South Africa, uh, sometimes twice a year for many years with other people, including uh, Ernst von Jarsfeld, uh, Bruce Bayer. Uh, uh, Steve Black who is with us today as well here, and uh, which makes him one of the elite STEM experts in the world here. Uh, he's written uh, he's written quite a few books here, some of them with interesting titles like uh, "Dumpling and His Wife," "New Views of Treasures of the Veld," felt, and uh, uh, a number of other uh, well-known books as well. There's too many to read list here. Uh, Mr. Hammer is. Uh, a fellow of the Catch and Second Society of America. He's received uh, research grants from CSSA, the MSM Study Group, National Geographic Society, uh, Kirchenbach Botanical Gardens, Huntington Gardens, Q, and the list of on and on. So, uh, uh, somebody's dog, that's good. So, uh, 
uh, we're glad to have you here. And uh, uh, so everyone, please help me and welcome Steve Hammer as he presents Plant Candy for Halloween, an examination of undiggable misms and the breeders who dig them. So let's give him a big hand here and then we'll get started. All right, Steve, uh, if you want to get your uh, welcome, I don't want to rush you into this thing here, but anytime you want to get started, uh, we can go ahead and do that and uh, bring up your PowerPoint and uh, we'll get going. Good morning, by the way, Steve. Morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I can't tell if I'm being viewed. I guess I am. Um, oh, I see myself in the corner. Yes, yes. I've never done one of these things. Oh, and uh, John Van Unen has explained to me how to change things. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that good. Um, okay, I didn't want to go there quite yet. That's uh, too dark. Uh, Gunnar asked me to do a presentation about six months ago. And at the time I thought, well, that would be nice to have a thing for Halloween, which is my favorite holiday by far. Um, and I thought I would do something sort of glamorous and talk about the latest new mesms and that sort of thing. And at exactly that point, the uh, collecting crisis in South Africa reached a, uh, a pinnacle. Uh, outrageous numbers of plants were being dug up. I mean, outrageous. I'll show you a few photographs in a moment to give you the idea. And I thought, good heavens, Conifidum doesn't need any more glamorization from me. On the other hand, I was for many years probably its principal glamorizer. I mean, if you wanted to read about conifidums, you had to deal with Steve Hammer and his prose and that sort of problem. And uh, so I was, I, I won't say I was the initiator of all the digging, but I presented the photographs and the descriptions that made these plants seem more desirable than they might have seemed otherwise. So when people ask whose fault is it that 250,000 plants were dug up. Um, I have a certain role in that in terms of my association with the genus, which makes me uh, extremely uncomfortable. And I therefore thought, oh no, I shouldn't talk about conas at all, never again. And shouldn't talk about data. Um, shouldn't make them more popular than they are already. Uh, but I, on the other hand, I think the, the uh, horses are out of the barn already. There's nothing I can really do about that. Uh, and then I thought, well, uh, the more interesting thing to talk about might be what happens to the plants once they reach cultivation and what do we do with them? and uh, How long do they live and do we turn them into cultivars or, or what do we do with them and, and why do we do it? And, and who's doing that too? And from that derived the idea of plant candy. In other words, that a lot of the plants for us uh, are somewhat divorced from South Africa. They have become entities under cultivation in themselves and, and we can enjoy them for what they are and what they can become. So I'm gonna be showing pictures of that too. But first a few pictures and I think this button will do it. I hope this button will do it. Which button is not doing it? Let's see, that one. I'm looking for my PowerPoint button. Hmm. Ah, okay, yeah. And I, yeah, here you can see a shipment uh, at the Johannesburg airport. Now in these boxes were lots and lots and lots of intercepted conifidums. Now look at the next picture. Um, on the left, you see conifidum acutum in more numbers than I would have believed existed in the wild. And then on the left, we have conifidum acabenza, uh, which is a conifidum that Steve Brack and I found in 1986. So this particular heist I took particularly personally, because I was responsible for the fact that people knew it existed in the first place. And again, it's astonishing the number of plants. Uh, look at that, there's thousands of them. Uh, and another indiscretion involved here is the fact that I named the conifidum after the farm, the farm Akab, and the name gives it away right away. And way back in 1988, uh, I discussed that with Charlie Glass and I thought about it seriously, should I name it after the farm? But my thinking was this plant is so obscure and so ugly, nobody's gonna ever wanna dig it up. Well, I was wrong. I was, I was quite wrong, obviously. You, you can see the evidence right there. And one of the reasons people dug it up is because they couldn't get it because it's actually rather slow from seed. Now, Steve and I, when I was back at Mesa with him, we supplied seed of conifidum acabenza for years. You, you could buy a packet for a dollar. 
So anybody who wanted to come to Makabenza could certainly get it. It wasn't an obstacle. They just had to wait six years for it to flower. The problem came about when all of a sudden Kanafadam became a craze uh, around the world, but particularly in the Orient. And instead of having 50 people wanting to grow Kanafadam Akabenza, you had 50,000. And that was an unsupportable market. There was nothing any of us could do here. Uh, I couldn't, you know, I have, I have six little Akabenzas and they produce maybe 300 seeds a year. And in the face of, of the demand for 20,000 plants, that's no good. Uh, and all the other people, including Matt Opal and many skilled English people, they have it too. So the annual harvest was maybe a thousand seeds, and that's that's no good uh, compared to the demand. So what do we do with the demand? What, what do we change it into? Uh, here's another instance of, of demand and supply. Look on the left, we have conified and burgeri. Now this particularly infuriated me because conified and burgeri was one of the first things I tried to introduce way back in the 1980s. You could get a, a packet of conified and burgerized seed for 75 cents and you would get 30 plants. Uh, and, and there are probably a million plants of this in China that are flowering right now. It's well established in cultivation. Uh, there's no conceivable reason or excuse for collecting uh, one of them, let alone 500 or whatever terrible number that is in the left-hand picture. And in the right, you see clusters of various kind of items. Uh, the explanation for the desire of that is that people, of course, do like old collected clusters. They want an old big plant, uh, which is maybe 50 years old. So they dig it up uh, instead of waiting 40 years in a pot, uh, the way people who would like to be virtuous do. So that's a ongoing problem, but it's not as bad a problem, I think, as the problem on the left, which is, to me, even grosser. Now we will switch to a happier topic. Um, I think if I get the button right, let's see. Hmm, my button is not working. Ah, no, we've. Ah, yes, here we have. No, um, this is this is in honor of Halloween. Uh, this is what can be done with these things in cultivation. Uh, in this case, it was done by Mr. Shimada, one of the very well-known Japanese breeders who's been working on cultivars of lithops. Oh, for the last, I think, 40 years at least. Uh, this was the one that particularly glows called Shimada's apricot. Uh, it's actually rather rare in cultivation. I don't think there's many plants of it around, but I happen to have three. And one reason it's rare here is that it doesn't like to flower. At least it doesn't like to flower for me. The plant you see, John Van Unen took this photo about, you know, let's see, I think four months ago. And it looked like it was about to open up and it still looks the same. It hasn't budded yet. So this thing is gonna remain a rarity for some time, but it has a very interesting color and it takes us rather far away from a normal Hookerai marginata. Now, if you look on the next picture, if I can get the button to work. Ah, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, here we see another possibility of extrapolation in, in lithops. Uh, you can take Lithops julii, which is the one on the left, and you can take Lithops uniciae, which is the one in the middle. And despite the fact that they belong to the two different subgenera of Lithops, you can in fact cross them. And you get the creature on the right, uh, has very interesting pattern, very much halfway between the parents, has a halfway in between flower too, which is yellowish white and very big. Uh, and it's a very strong plant, you can see very healthy, and it's a very nice plant to grow. Uh, in, in a certain sense, I suppose you could say that my making this kind of cultivar hybrid uh, has, has become a substitute for field work. I haven't been to South Africa for 14 years, uh, which is really quite ridiculous, but it's, it's, it's the fact. Uh, instead, I sit here in Vista and I make my own cultivars, um, which are popular and uh, which actually provide some <laughs> sustainable income. It's, it's really rather funny. Uh, and I have to say that I think in this case, the creation of cultivars at least involves no further damage to nature. Uh, as I said before, nobody can dig them up. Uh, they, they don't exist in nature. They never will exist in nature. And these two would be impossible to exist in nature. They're 500 kilometers apart. So they will never meet, but they can meet in a greenhouse and make a very interesting plant, very, very attractive. And John's gonna push the button for me because I'm too stupid. Uh, let's see. Or my oh, there we go. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Now the next one. Uh, 
Yeah, here's another extrapolation. You can take Lithos gracilla lineata, which is normally sort of ivory colored or grayish colored, but it can be orange and you can take a cultivar of that and add another cultivar to it and you end up with another pumpkin, a very effective looking plant uh, with a very nice pattern. Um, you can see some plants that people would call cafe au lait from the white creamy islands and you can see others that people would call brand cafe, uh, which is more the orangish type, the one on, on the right. Uh, they're, they're very nice plants, they're rather slow, they're not as easy to grow uh, as the parents, unlike a lot of my cultivars, they're more difficult rather than easy. I generally try to make them so they're more accessible to cultivation and not the opposite, but in that case, it didn't happen. And you put up with it, you try to, you try to breed a better one is what you try to do. Now we've got to switch another button. Hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> now we just skipped one. Um, that, that is uh, Conifatum subfenestratum, which is, curiously enough, uh, has escaped most of the commercial digging, uh, at least so far. And I, I have to say there's some good news. I believe that the onslaught of field collecting has pretty much finished, partly because the price dropped, uh, how terrible as that reason might be. And nobody was digging up this particular one because it's so well established in cultivation and it's so easy that it just hasn't been touched very much as far as I know. Uh, Carol might know other stories about it, but I, I hear about some of the collecting. I don't hear about all of it, of course, but I, I do hear uh, problems reported by Nature Conservation. And this one isn't on any list that I've seen, at least not lately. Uh, but you can see it's a very beautiful plant. Now I show it here partly because this one has a very interesting pattern. That, that cross on the top, you don't see that very often. So I'm trying to turn this one into a cultivar on its own. In other words, I'm trying to enhance the pattern that the plant already has. Uh, just, I just do a back cross and then I can see if I can get another one. And sure enough, you can. You can basically, as a breeder, you can enhance almost anything you want. You have to be willing to do two or three or four generations, which may end up taking you 10 or 15 or 20 years. Uh, a lot of these I have been working. Well, here's a good example. I'll go back for a second, if you could. Okay, this this is the one I called Zorro, and which is pretty rare in cultivation because it doesn't normally uh, end up like this with a nice Zorro pattern, like his, uh, his, his mark of the dagger or the sword. Um, and supposedly it doesn't stay the same, but that's not actually true. These have been the same for 40 years now. Uh, these were actually bred not by me, but by Ed Storms. And when I saw Ed's collection, which it was in the, it was, had been adopted by Jane Evans, uh, who has, of course, living, uh, living stones in, in Arizona. And so what I saw when I saw Ed's plants was obviously a work in progress. These are various cultivars that he'd been working on himself, uh, hadn't had time to finish because he died terribly prematurely and unexpectedly. So what we were left with was a lot of interesting evidence. And this was obviously something he had bred. Uh, he had a whole flat full of it. And he must have been looking at the same attractive patterns that Jane and I admired, namely the reduction of the usual window into a sort of a, a thin band. Uh, you can see more on the right. Uh, some of these come actually, the ones on the right come from uh, from Tim Jackson, who's also been breeding these. Uh, Tim is another very accomplished breeder in California. Um, and he's been, he's been doing it almost as long as I have. Uh, there's a lot of people involved in this work, uh, not just the younger people and, and not just the few more established people like myself. There, there's a lot of us. Uh, some people just don't write a whole lot. So you, you don't hear about them quite as often. For some reason, my cursor is not obeying. I don't know why. Let's see. John is fiddling with it. Let's see what we can get it to do. Hmm. That's strange. The buttons don't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we've skipped a couple, but that's that's um, we'll improvise here. Yes. Okay. Here is another. Uh, cultivar involving Lithops julii. Now this is the one I called hot lips. And I think that's pretty obvious why I called it hot lips, those, those red markings. 
uh, I should have named it Dracula's Feast or something like that in honor of Halloween, that would be good. But if you cross hot lips, the one on the left with peppermint cream, uh, the one seen on the ultimate right, uh, the, the single plant, uh, you can see that you can keep a green body and unite it with red lips. Uh, that's quite, quite possible to do, uh, the way the genes transfer over. So that's an interesting, you could call it another cultivar if you like, or you can just call it green hot lips. I, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. But the real point is that you can increase the spectrum with, without a whole lot of work. Now, by the way, just in the same photograph, just to call your attention to it, you, you can see uh, there, there's a Leslie Aventri with a nice big gray window. Now that's what people call Marazii, and that's it's another product of Ed Storms's brush. He, he was working on this for years, and he had so many of them that everybody thought that they were normally black. They're not normally black, they're normally gray, but Ed's, Ed Storms refined the pattern into this nice black pool. It's a very interesting effect. Um, let's see if we can get the next picture. Yeah, now here's some more uh, hot lips, but these are a couple of Chinese people named this one honey lips. I think they must have been working independently for me, but we both ended up with the same thing, uh, namely a green bodied lithops that has lips, but in this case, not red lips, not bloody lips, but honey lips. It's, it's a good name actually. And it's surrounded in case you're wondering by Ocampia unicea uh, bellichetti, which is an Italian uh, cultivar, very very widespread and effective one, which is quite easy to grow and has taken over cultivation quite effectively. It just happens I have the two green things in one pot. There's no connection between them otherwise. I just thought you ought to see the honey lips. And here's some more hot lips. You see, these are sort of orangey lips and bloody lips. And so you can, and there's another green one on the upper right portion. So the, the spectrum can be increased all the time and there's, there's really no end to it. Let's see what they have. Oh, now we're back to Dorothea. Now here's some more Dorotheas, more Zoros. And the reason I wanted you to see this one, if you look at the plan on the right with that trilobe nature, uh, some people like them that way. I can't stand them that way. Steve Brack used to call them three bangers from an unfortunate habit of calves being born that way. But um, I find it very strange looking, but it is, I think, partly the product of inbreeding because most of these cultivars uh, have severe inbreeding problems. They, they've got to, they've got one mother and then she's used as a grandmother and a great grandmother. Uh, at least that's the way I usually do it. And every time I do that, I, I reduce a certain degree of vitality and I increase a certain degree of weirdness. Now, if you want weirdness like variegation, that's fine. You'll get variegates too, and you'll get three and four and five lobes. Uh, that's one way to do it. Um, it often short circuits itself though, because such a plant is not so likely to flower. So you get very strange reproductive problems too, but you can also get beautiful plants like the one on the left. Now, anybody worrying about cultivars would probably remark that the one on the left isn't a particularly good zero and it, or zero rather, and is more typical of a really elegant normal uh, Dorothea. And that's true. Uh, a great many cultivars are in fact not uh, truly stable at all. Now, are they therefore cultivars? Or are they attempts at cultivars? There was one year when I was still with Steve at Mesa Garden, and one year we offered uh, Lithops otseniana, green otseniana, and I called it green attempts. Now that wasn't a description, that wasn't a name, it was just a description of what you might get if you sowed the seeds. Well, I then found that appearing on all kinds of labels. It's not a real cultivar name. It's just a, it's an aspirational thing. Some were green and some were blue and some were normal brown. But and anyway, you, you get a lot of failures when you do cultivars, you get mostly failures. You have to get used to that. Or you get interesting failures, put it that way. Now we can switch. I think we can switch if my cursor works again. Come on cursor. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, moving, moving forwards and backwards. Uh, here we have something which is not a cultivar at all. Uh, this is uh, Mania Confida Mania Armeniacum. Uh, it's an interesting form that I found with Chris Barnhill way back in 1996. And it's outstanding, for, well, you can see the outstanding feature, this beautiful red color, uh, which is really permanent. It, it doesn't change into this color, it keeps this color. And it's therefore an extremely good uh, parent for breeding because that red is gonna dye anything it, it touches. 
Uh, I learned that a long time ago about the cultivars. If you want a really intense color, pick the best darkest plant you've got and, and use it extensively. And it really will work. But in this case, the red is particularly beautiful. And it's also a curious form for people who are interested in nature, that is, in real nature. Uh, it grows on concrete instead of uh, the normal uh, uh, quartz where you'd expect it. So it's an interesting form too. And it's also found quite far to the east of where it should be. So, so two little features it has. Okay, next picture should show us. Yes, yes. Uh, this is this is a very famous cultivar now. Um, and this one, this cultivar really had four points of origin. Uh, the first was Rolf Rava, who used to write articles for our journal way back in the 60s, many, many articles about conifidum. Uh, in a way, he was my direct predecessor, and he he really should have written a conifidum book himself. I wish he had. Uh, his interest took other forms and he got into tillandsias and orchids and cacti and all kinds of things. But in his heyday, he was a great kind of an explorer and uh, grower and distributor. I mean, you could get many, many seeds from Rolf Rava in the 60s that went to the African Succulent Plant Society. And Vitabergensa, or minimum as I call it now, was one of his most popular distributions. And I decided to see maybe, I thought, almost 30 years ago, if I could breed one with a darker pattern. Uh, instead of the network you see, I, I wanted something all black. And I, I essentially gave up on the project after about 10 years of effort because the plants would always revert. They'd be good one year and the next year they'd be dull. And so I gave up, but I gave uh, plants and seeds to Chris Rogerson and Andy Young in, in England and they carried on and they had more patience than I did and they had better luck. And I think they just worked harder. And they ended up with these superbly black plants. Uh, this, uh, John Van Unen took this picture when the plant wasn't looking as good as it can look, but in a good year, uh, it's completely black. It's a wonderful velvety look. Um, so you, you can work with that and you can cross it with other things as we'll see in a second. But uh, if we go on to the next picture, yeah, well, here, here's the example. If you cross this with Monii, we just saw that nice red Monii. If you cross that with Udibergensis, you keep part of the color of the Monii, but you keep part of the pattern of the Vitabregensis in this very elegant kind of tracery, which I find very appealing. And this is one of my most popular cultivars. I don't think I ever named it. I just said the formula and people wanted it. So maybe somebody else has named it. I don't know. Um, but it's beautiful plant. It's strong. It's healthy. But it has one of the, the defects that many cultivars has. It's sterile or nearly sterile. If you look at the fruits, they don't look very good. They're not very full. There might be two seeds in there and one of them might be good. Uh, so people tend to propagate this thing vegetatively. Uh, fortunately, it's so strong and it's, it's quite, uh, you know, it, it divides a lot. You can see it's, so it's not, it's not a slow thing uh, to propagate that way, but it's not as quick as it would be by seed, but that's very difficult to achieve. So uh, it's just a pity, but a, a lot of the cultivars are sterile or nearly sterile. Just have to understand that. Now the next picture, if we get it to work, I hope. I <laughs> try that again. Uh, now, uh, we, we went backwards in time for a second. Here, here's <coughs> yeah, well, the, the, the original point of this was to show you how similar this pattern is to the hybrid pattern, that same uh, sort of tracery on the top. But the other point of the slide was to show you another feature of conifidum. Now, this is how they look in April. They're starting to go dormant. They look sort of, people often think they're sick. They're not sick at all. They're just sleepy. And those skins are dying skins. It's replacing itself with a new body, which you can barely see inside. It's fresh and green, but it first has the skin over. You can see at the edge, you can see even an older skin from the previous year. And then there's a new skin forming. Now, if you go on to the next slide, which I hope we will do in a second, um, if this machine obeys us. Come on, machine. Come on, machine. I hate machines. Come on, machine. Oh, here it is. Now, it just freshly emerged. John took this one uh, in August, as you can see. And now we have the fresh green bodies. Meanwhile, the old skins have, have died back to nothing, just to a paper. And as soon as they're reduced to the paper, you can start to water and start the cycle all over again. So that's really all you need to know about how to grow conifidums. You watch the skin. It's, it's, it, it really could not be simpler. There's no big mystery to it. Uh, they're very 
very flexible that way, very adaptable. And now you can see the beautiful pattern. Now this one was an interesting plant for another reason. Uh, this was distributed by Ed Storms. And Ed Storms got the original seed from none other than Rolf Rava. And he was a customer of Rolf's for, for a number of years. And this is one of the most beautiful things he got from Rolf. And it turns out that the plant is actually not fixed form, it's actually placidum, uh, which I rather, in a way, rather ignorantly sunk it into ficus forma because I didn't understand it at the time. There are actually two uh, similar looking species which behave in very different ways. And I think one of the, for me, the, the test of that was that I'm unable to cross conifata ficus forma and placidum. They just don't like each other. Uh, so you have to cross a placidum with another placidum, which I just did, because I want to get more seedlings of this very high order. I mean, it's a really very beautiful plant. Next picture. Should work. Should work. Caught the delay. <laughs> it seems to be stuck on this lovely image. Well, I don't think this isn't quite the end, by the way. I mean, it's not the end of the line, but not the end of the slides, not the end of the world. Um, oh, well, that was an interesting change. Okay. I don't know how he did that, but uh, we, we have switched our order rather uh, in, intriguingly, but that, that's okay. Yeah, we'll go from here. Uh, this is what happens if you if you uh, decide to try to pollinate conifidum burgeri and conifidum monii. Now I did that not really for cultivar reasons or aesthetic reasons, but because they grow together. And I wondered how they avoid hybridization. Do they not like each other? Well, they actually like each other pretty much. Uh, you can get a hybrid, but the hybrid uh, is virtually sterile. So I think that's why when we go look for conifata burgeri, and if they're not all dug up by then, and found, find burgeri growing with mania, they don't cross. Uh, but there's another reason they don't cross, which is that burgeri opens in the late afternoon and Manii opens in the evening. So in theory, there wouldn't be a great deal of overlap, but there would be some potential overlap of, of season of, of daily time. So I think you, you could get it, but uh, if nature does what I do, that you wouldn't get a very good result. Now there's another picture right after this with, yeah, now here it is, uh, the plants have now emerged from their skin. And it's actually in a strange way, rather beautiful plant. I used to think it was rather repulsive, but now I think it looks like an ice cube and I like the fact that it's rather flat on top. So it's, uh, it's an interesting plant. Uh, it has a rather diminished flower. It's not as good as a burgeri flower and not as good as a monii flower. So it's not gonna win uh, the Chauvin's prize, I, I don't think, but it's, it's interesting. And for people who like freaky things, uh, this will go to the top of the list. So and there's a whole group of collectors who they, they're not in it for the beauty as such, they're in it for the weirdness. And you know, I, a lot of things I can offer them from, from that point of view, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, not that I've propagated this thing, I have exactly the one plant you see, and I, I don't really wanna chop it up. And it, it's taken it 25 years to get to this state, so it's never gonna be a, a commercial plant, I don't think. Unless somebody makes a bit. Now this, on the other hand, is gonna be a commercial plant. It is already a commercial plant. Uh, this, the label is a little incomplete. It's actually Stephanii helmurii crossed with Manii. And in the uh, lower right corner, you see a pure subspecies Helmudii, uh, lovely little fuzzy bodies. And the, the dominant picture with all the, all the heads, that's uh, Helmudii crossed with Manii, Manii being the female. And you can see it's incredibly prolific. It's very strong, every head flower is very, very, very easy to grow, very easy to coax out of the skin. Uh, the skin is the skin on the upper right. That, that's a Don Juan, which is the name of the, the, uh, the hybrid. Uh, when it's dormant, it looks awful. Uh, it looks, looks dead. It's not dead at all. If you cracked open one of those little envelopes, you would see a fresh green one underneath. But you wouldn't want to do that because that would expose it to the rays of the sun. And this was taken in midsummer. So you're better off just leaving it alone and waiting until October, giving it a drink, and then it'll pop out gloriously and flower two weeks later. It's, it's one of the hybrids that I feel most justified in having made because it's easy, it's quick, it's, it's beautiful, it has wonderful perfume, uh, and it's uh, just, just a good plant for, for cultivation. Now, it, and I don't think it's also, there's often the argument, 
offered that cultivars and hybrids are confusing. Well, they're confusing if you lose your labels, but uh, they're not confusing at all. Nobody is going to confuse the big one and the little one. They're, they're quite different organisms. And another interesting feature, the, uh, the hybrid is nearly sterile. And of course, the Helmudia Helmudia is not sterile at all. So, uh, and it doesn't even like to have pollen from Don Juan. It wants to be pure. So uh, I don't think they're going to be confused in the future. Also, the one is short haired and the other is long haired. So I'm not so worried about that kind of confusion. In the case of lithops hybrids, I think there's more, more to worry about. Now, th this is a little bit confusing and it's in a couple of ways. Uh, if you look at the three images of the, the windowed plant or the, well, the, the clustered windowed plant, uh, this is the sister of Don Juan. Now you would hardly believe they came out of the same fruit, but they did. Uh, this one doesn't have any hair, but it has much more windows than Don Juan. And it has a rather similar flower, but not as good. It's pink instead of, instead of red or maroon. But it's a lovely plant, and I named it after my beloved mother, uh, Eleanor, because it sounds like Eleanor Rigby, which is the only Beatle tune that she knew or recognized. She was a, a classical musician, and she was much more strict and snobbish than I am about classical music, but, which was, and, and she didn't even know who Frank Sinatra was, which is amazing. But she had heard of Eleanor Rigby and she actually admired the Beatles. So this is Eleanor's Ruby. It's a beautiful plant. It turns a Ruby color a little later in the season. So it's beautiful. Uh, it has a weed, by the way, if you look on the left hand side, you'll see Valeria de Boeri. I have a policy that I've had for years. If a weed comes up in a pot, I leave it. Uh, if it's a lithops weed in particular, I don't want to disturb it. For one thing, it's always healthier than a non-weed. It somehow chose to grow there. And I want to see what's going to happen. There are other weeds in the pot. There's, uh, oh, there's half a dozen other lithops. But it's just, it confuses the image visually, but I didn't want to remove them. So there they are. Next picture. Oh, yes, here's another hybrid. Uh, and this one also involves Manii. Manii, in case you want to pursue this yourself, uh, Manii is the most promiscuous of all kind of items. You can cross it with almost anything. Uh, you can cross it with bilobum. You can cross it with vetsteinia. You can cross it with ernstii. And they all work quite effectively. In this case, I crossed it with lithopsoides. And in the uh, lower right portion, you can see a pure lithopsoides with the long fissure going across. If you look at the hybrids above it and to the left of it, you can see a sort of a halfway fissure. What you can't see in the picture is that the flower is beautiful. It's a big purple flower. It's, it's better than the mother. It's better than the father. It's one of the nicest flowered hybrids I've made so far. So if, if you're going for conophytums, for floral beauty, this would be a good choice. And it's easy to make. I, I could remake it. You could make it. Uh, but if you look at the fruit, you'll see, aha, we have another sterile plant. It's not interested in vegetative reproduction at all. Uh, at least not so far. I haven't succeeded with it. Okay, next picture. Uh, now here, here's an example of inbreeding. Uh, this is not a hybrid. Uh, it's, a, it's a Purina, uh, but it involves uh, Valetii, uh, sorry, uh, Fulleride C259, which is uh, the one closest to Gamoop, a, a town many of you will know well. It's not a town, it's a gas station actually, but uh, around Gamoop, for some reason, Fulleride has a, this reddish tendency. And I had a very red example uh, and I decided to cross it with another red example, uh, which I got from Jonathan Clark, who is another lithops breeder in UK. Uh, very interesting man with very nice collection and very keen on precisely this sort of thing. And I discovered on the visit that he had a red one too, and I had a red one. So he gave me a cutting of his and we had a transatlantic marriage and it produced lots and lots of beautiful red plants. The one in the lower right, I think is the best. It's the same as the one to its left. But here you'll see another example of the pitfalls of inbreeding. If you look at the plant in the uh, upper, uh, actually the, the upper left, you can see there's a strange distortion of the, uh, the fissure shape. Uh, you can see the same thing in the uh, lower right as well. Um, in fact, these plants tend not to flower because they, the leaves are so separated, they're, they're quite distorted. And they eventually die. Now the one on the, the main one is, is healthy, but there's, I'd say a third of the plants are really bad. Uh, I should just kill them, but I, I hate to do that, but they, they end up killing themselves. Uh, but that's, again, the danger of inbreeding. Now, what you can do, of course, and should do, is take another 259 less close to this, uh, probably a wider 259 and back cross that, and do another two generations, and then you've got a little more circulation going. 
but th that is a problem with these breeding experiments. I, I've had it often and I didn't understand it for years. I used to blame myself, but well, still it's my fault, but it's, it, it's something that happens a lot and you, you can't stop it. Next picture. Uh, yeah, here's another, another project that I like quite a bit. Uh, this is a project which involves uh, increased ease of floriferousness and growth. A lot of people complain about growing Optica rubra. It grows too late. It wants to flower in February. It, it doesn't change its leaves. It's no good. Although it's a beautiful color. Well, I discovered years ago that if you cross it with Lithops harii, which has a yellow flower and, and a flower born in the, in the middle of fall, uh, that you got half and half red ones and, and gray ones. And the gray ones and the red ones were very strong, easy to flower, beautiful, big, glorious yellow flower. Uh, and to me, it has a side benefit. It has a nice, interesting modeled pattern. So I like it a lot. Now, in this case, I used Heria splendida, which is an Italian cultivar of a white flowered Heriae. And I crossed that with actually another Heriae and then uh, Optica rubra. And I got these creatures who have yellow flowers. Now, the next picture taken four months later shows you how well they change their skin and how easily they grow. And these are, these are actually budding right now. So two months ahead of Optica rubra. So if you don't mind the modeling, it's a very good, if you want to say, substitute or supplementation of Optica rubra. It has about the same shape and it's essentially the same color. You can pick out darker ones, but it, it's a beautiful thing. Everybody likes it. Uh, I gave seeds of, Mr., of this to Mr. Shimada recently, and I think he will enjoy it and he'll probably improve it and turn it into an all-purple creature or something. He, he's got more patience than I do. Uh, next picture. Ah, now here's, here's a product uh, which came from South Africa, um, uh, Lithops Bromfielde Glaudinia embers. Um, has a beautiful, beautiful color. I, I needn't say a word about it. It's, it. it speaks for itself. It's so nice. The normal Glaudinia has reddish tints on a brown body, but this has, well, it has brownish tints on a red body. I mean, it's really very intense. Uh, and the, uh, it, it sparkles, and I, I like it very much. Um, I, have, I think I have one more picture of it if I've got the sequence right. Oh no, I have a similar thing. Um, this, this is a product of uh, ingenuity from Jane Evans. Uh, she wanted a red Leslie eye. And instead of doing the way I did it, which was involved in mutation, which we'll be seeing in a second, uh, she took Leslie eye rubra and she took the two reddest ones and then she pollinated those together. And she did that again and again and again, I think five times. And she ended up with this wonderful creature she calls Red Dog after a beloved pet. And it has a truly red color all year round. It's really beautiful. You can see the red islands all over. A very, very nice plant, uh, very strong and big. I think it's much better than any of my red efforts uh, combined. Uh, it's just not as well known because she hasn't had it as long in, in a perfect state and she hasn't propagated as much as I have, but it's, it, it's a really wonderful plant. Big, big yellow flower. Everything about it is good. Now you can compare it with the next one, uh, which is my, I have to say, well-known red redhead. Um, and this one had a, well, this is redhead crossed with horny eyes. So it's actually red horn uh, to use the name I, I, I chose for it. Uh, but you can see it's very red and the red is very, very similar to the color of the Ruber Bernea intensification. Uh, I'd say it's almost as good but it's not really as good as Jane's plant. It's not quite as strong. It has some distortion involved. The leaves don't always look perfect. Um, it's just, just not, not quite as satisfactory a plant, uh, but it has a very good color, I have to say, and you can get a perfect one if you work at it. And it's certainly popular. Now here's another project, which I've been working on for a long time. I call it Verdigree. Uh, it's related to Rose of Texas, which was another product of Ed Storms's ingenuity. Uh, Verdigris is a little greener and has very curious shade. You can see in the, uh, the, uh, the right-hand side, a particularly green body. Uh, has a normal flower of Rose of Texas, a pink or purplish, but a, a lovely green body. The next picture shows that a little more intensification. Very strange color, actually, with these little red pimples all over, hence the name Verruculosa. Now, the next picture, if I've got... Yeah, th this is Verruculosa variety Ine. Um, it actually should have been Lithops ine because that's the uh, original name, but it's got reversed and there's nothing anybody wants to do about it now. I, I like to call it Lithops ine, but anyway, um, the reason I like that is because Lithops ine was described as having red pimples 
And lithospherulosa was described as having gray pimples. Well, it doesn't, does it? But whereas any does. So anyway, the reason I show this one here is because it has a very beautiful blue sides, blue gray sides. And I've been trying to intensify that too. I haven't really succeeded to the point where there's something I would name as a cultivar, but I've certainly been trying for a very long time because I like the colors so much. And a lot of people ask me for blue lithops. Do I have any blue lithops? Well, this is the closest I could offer at the moment, but I'm sure you could get a, a better effect than this and a more stable one if you really worked at it. Next picture. Oh, now here we're back to concavum, uh, which actually was the original slide I showed you. I just didn't expound upon it. Um, concavum is one of the ones that's been dug up in the maybe 100,000, in, incredible numbers, uh, criminal, terrible, terrible numbers. Uh, but this plant was collected uh, by, by Mr. Lebranos oh, about 25 years ago. And I don't know if he collected it because it was red or it was just part of what he collected. But anyway, uh, the clone reached cultivation and it reached me and it has this wonderful red flush, uh, which it keeps most of the year. It's a fantastic color. Uh, if you look at the next picture, you'll see the normal concavum color, which is uh, sort of a, a dull green, nice enough color, uh, sometimes with the yellow flower, which you can barely see because these flowers are going off, but uh, nothing like the beautiful red of, of the red clone of, of concavum. Uh, next picture. Now, here's something which hasn't been uh, attended to by hybridists, or at least not very much, uh, Conifatum heleni, another product of, of Rava. Uh, he rediscovered it after a 1937 find. He found it uh, 30 years later. Uh, it's a beautiful little chiseled thing, very floriferous, very easy to grow. It makes a natural hybrid with conoflavum and possibly with conobilobum as well. So it would be a good candidate for any cultivated work if anybody wants to uh, attempt that. Uh, some people, of course, don't, don't like making hybrids. They uh, don't find them interesting or attractive or even theologically sound, which I would disagree with, but they just don't do them. Uh, other people uh, love them, uh, find them more enticing than the real plants. And in a way, I have been trying to entice that group of people into making more on the argument that it takes uh, attention away from the wild populations as, as vulnerable objects, not as scientific objects, but as vulnerable commercial objects. So the more people make hybrids in nature in cultivation, the better, as far as I'm concerned. The, the fact that nature makes them too is an additional intrigue to me because uh, they, they can be very beautiful. But this one already has made hybrids in cultivation and in nature. So we have a lesson there. Next picture. Uh, here's another hybrid, but this is a hybrid that I made for ease. And, and also because nature does it too. If you cross Comptonii, which is a little tiny fragile thing, Rather hard to grow in the States. I'd, I'd say less difficult in UK where it's moister, but hard for me in California. But on the other hand, uh, if you cross it with Arbcadellum, which is a big tough girl, uh, you can get very strong plants which look like Comptonia, except they're slightly too large. And the pattern is not quite as ornate as it should be, but otherwise as a substitute, if that's the proper word for Comptonia, it's, it's very effective. Makes beautiful clusters, lovely flowers, uh, it's just not quite as elegant as the real thing. Now, maybe that's not enough. Maybe it is enough. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I like it a lot. But I, of course, I also have the regular Comptonia too, and I just struggle with it. I, I can grow it, but I can't grow it easily. This, this I couldn't kill. And there, there's a difference there, obviously. Next picture. Oh, now here, here's a plant which nobody has, has tried to improve. That's why I'm showing it. I don't think it can be improved or altered in any way. Uh, this is Van Heerde Promosii. A wonderful old plant. This was actually this. The, these plants were actually sown way back in 1974 from Rolf Rava's seed, and they're still growing strong. They're a little bit leggy now. That's I, I also showed this slide for that reason. If you have an old collection, which you know I certainly do, <laughs> I'm probably one of the older ones in captivity. I'm afraid you have a lot of old plants. They're basically going see now. They're going old. They become old and stemmy. Now, what do you do about that? Well, you can die then you don't have to worry about it. That's a time-honored solution. I don't really like that solution for myself, although I will, of course, reach it eventually, although I have plans for that too. But anyway, um, what you can do if you choose not to tempt fate is to chop up the plants. Now, what I should do right now, next week, is take all those old poor primosii and chop them down uh, to a third their size, get rid of the stem and reroot them and have a new plant, which will then live another 50 years with no problem. 
If I don't do that, the plant will eventually die because it'll become too weak from stemminess. This is also true with conophytums. It's even true with lithops, but most people don't let their lithops get 60 years old. But if they do get 60 years old, they will also become leggy, certain clones especially, and then they will do the same thing. They, they will die. So you really do have to chop them up. Um, now, as for the breeding aspect, I have tried to process a few things without any particular success. I can cross it with its sister species, but you just end up with a Van Heerde with a less pronounced window. Uh, so it's probably not a good idea. Next picture. Now, th this was maybe a good idea, maybe not a good idea. This is what I call rat burger. I actually did it because I thought the name was funny. Uh, if you cross conifatum rotum with burger, you get a rat burger and they are, uh, they're fertile. Uh, they work pretty well. They're pretty strong. Uh, I don't think it's quite as beautiful as rotum, but it's probably in a way more beautiful than burger eye. Uh, they're neighbors, by the way, the two species. And I was curious if they had any compatibility because I think they're derived from the same herb burger probably. And here they are, you can see it's a perfectly healthy thing. It, it's one of the rare hybrids I've got, which if you handed it to me, I would probably mistake it for a wild species. It doesn't, there's nothing quote unquote defective about it and there's nothing outlandish about it either but it isn't, quote unquote, not a real plant. It's a man-made product. Next picture. Now here's something also nobody has worked with, um, but I show it here because it's very, very old. These are glottophyll and pygmaeums from seed that Gerhard Marx and I collected way back in 1990, 1991. Uh, now these plants are a little bit bigger than a quarter. It, so it's pygmaeum is a good name for it. Um, maybe a silver dollar. A lovely little thing. I repotted them recently and they actually grew more than I quite wanted them to because I like them to be very, very tiny and colorful. But it's it's a wonderful species which has been sunk uh, into a lot of firm, I think it's Piersi, where it certainly doesn't belong. I think it's a good species all on its own. And it occurs on a farm where at the head of the farm you see there's a signpost that says home to 10,000 sheep. And you think of that, you think, oh, that's home to 10,000 quivering glottophyllums because what are they gonna do with the sheep? As, as it happens, they hide in the shade and I don't think the sheep have found them, but it is a rare thing. And you, you will see it a little bit in UK cultivation. There's some very old plants there and people also have been chopping them up. So obviously I'm not the first person to discover that you need to chop up your mesms every 10 years. That was, well, that's been known since Hayworth's day. It was 1830. So you, you do have to chop them up. Next picture. Uh, here's another way to do red horn. Um, and if you, if you look at it, you can see, and, and Russell, Russell Wagner gave this one a new name, uh, the, the so-called brown horns. He crossed the brown horns together and he got what he calls bronzina, which is this, this creature in the lower left, uh, or the left-hand side, I should say. Now, if you cross enough bronzinos together, you may get more red horns. You can see there's two beautiful red ones in the middle. So that's another way to do it. Next picture shows you, now this, this is funny. Uh, this is an unaltered, un undoctored Lithops Leslie, the plain old Jane Leslie that we knew when, when we were children. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's, it's a beautiful species, beautiful plant, nice and strong. Um, and part of me hates the cultivar world because it tends to lead to the neglect of these old wonderful things, which were, you know, given to us by nature and they, they don't need quote unquote improvement. All they need is conservation and preservation. Um, I've had this plant for 50 years. It's a wonderful old plant. Um, doesn't grow very much, doesn't get very big. A natural is not, not necessarily a very big thing. And I could turn it into a show plant with a great big pot, but I'm not interested in that. I like keeping it the way it is. I just thought I should show you an, an unaltered Lithops Leslie. You get the idea. Next picture, here's, here's some altered Le Leslie eyes. This is when you also when you cross red horns and brown horns, you can actually get variegation of a sort. Look at that red sort of stripe you get. There's two plants in this pot which have red stripes. And of course, I intend to cross those two together and get more red stripes because I'm not unsympathetic to the variegated people. I just feel like I belong to a different species, but still they, they have their, their rights and, and their ways and that, that's fine. Uh, I prefer the, uh, the bronzino in the middle, the, the two-headed one with its, it's uh, sort of skew because it's been doubled for quite a while. Next picture. I think we're almost out of pictures. In fact, I think we have three or four more. Uh, this is kind of Fatim Caroli um, or Caroli. Uh, this is a, a good example, which unfortunately has been uh, 
exploited rather recently. Um, it was discovered and entered the market. And suddenly the, the value went up, I would say, a thousand times, which is ra rather incredible and, and deeply stupid. And there it was. Now we'll go on to the next picture, which is a variation on that. Um, I'll just say Northern because I don't want to say any more than that. But this one has beautiful little ridges, which are not continuous. They're little, little, little sort of uh, little humps here and there. So it's therefore difficult, uh, difficult or easy to distinguish from a normal lithos varicosum or confident varicosum, which is very rough on top. This is only partially rough and it has beautiful pink flowers. So it's a different thing. And it's also very tiny. Uh, so that's an interesting new discovery. So I will show one new discovery. Now here's Lithops nerinii, the famous Lithops nerinii, rather pinker than normal, but not nearly as pink as the next one, which is a beautifully pink thing. Now this one was discovered by my friend Sebastian Lee, and he raised a bunch of seedlings and he got four purples and he loaned them to me, thinking I was more likely to get seeds than he was, and maybe that's true. But anyway, uh, two of the, the ones in the upper part of the pot have flowered and made seeds already. So it's, it's a really wonderful color. I'm very happy to have it. Now we have one last picture, which was taken by John. I think I took this one. Was that in August or was April? It was in August. In August, yeah. And um, the point of showing this slide is two points. One is that it's a hybrid between Argyroderma and Lithops. Uh, but the other interesting point to me is that it was made around 1950 by Meredith Morgan, who's an optometrist at UC Berkeley. And he was a very good friend of Myron Kimnack. And at Kimnack worked in those days at the Berkeley Greenhouse. And so they, they got to know each other. And Meredith Morgan grew everything. He also was the author, if you want to put it that way, of uh, uh, Crashwell and Morgan's Beauty. It's the same guy, uh, Dr. Mo Dr. Morgan. Uh, obviously a good horticulturalist and a curious one because he liked to combine things. Uh, like like yours truly. And this is one that I had, he didn't record the formula for some reason. So I spent 10 years trying to re replicate it. I finally did. Uh, I figured it had to be a windowed lithops and probably RG deladii because that was the dominant one in cultivation at that point. So I got plants which were very similar, but this is the original one from 1950. And it was preserved by, of course, by Myron Kimnack, who gave me a piece. And then I propagated it. And so quite a few people have it. It's, it's not common in cultivation, but uh, here it is. And it's, it's a wonderful example of past work that's still, still with us. Uh, so I, I will close on that particular note, but maybe people have questions. Uh, now, I think now I go to me or something like that. Okay. Okay. Wow, wonderful presentation. Uh, whoop, we, lost, we lost Steve for, for some reason. Where, where are you? Okay, there you are. Okay, so Steve Braxton. Uh, Steve at all. I, see, I see this, Steve, but not... Okay, yeah, okay. I'm going to ask... Uh, What's that sound? ...to unmute themselves. We have a lot of questions here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, let me unmute uh, Steve. And in, in the meantime, maybe... Uh, are you ready, to, Steve? Are you ready to to answer some questions? Oh, me? I do. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I so, <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe uh, Irvin or Rod, maybe you can pose a question to Steve, and we'll get started. St Steve, uh, what's? Could you explain more about chopping your conifidums and lithops up? That seems to be the primary questions. Like, how do mm. you do it? Yeah. yeah. What, well, it's, it's interesting practice. You know, if you had, um, let's say you had a ruchia, you know, a bushy normal mesm with long stems, it'd be obvious where to cut it. You're just, you're just dividing the thing up. Now, when you have a lithops or a conifatum, you have typically a very short stem. It's all compressed. You know, the inner nodes are very close together. So you want to cut it right below the, you know, the, the succulent part of the body maybe a quarter inch, maybe half an inch, but really no more because the most active part is gonna be right at that part of the stem. Now it looks a little brutal and you think, oh my God, I'm gonna be excavating the bottom of this thing and it's never gonna come back. But that's not true because the growing point is, is well above the point where you're gonna cut. It's another quarter inch above. So anyway, you, you, you cut it there. You can also, if you're cautious, you can, you can give yourself an inch of stem. That's okay too but it's probably going to root from the upper portion, not from the lower portion, or it may root for the entire, it, it may send out four roots on either side. You, you don't know. 
Anyway, after you cut it, then you think, well, what do I do? You're going to dry it. Now, some people, if they're very cautious, they'll dry it for a week. They'll lay it in the shade and let it dry up. And then, then of course, you have a, a, a wound which is healed. Uh, I never do that. I just stick it back in the pot in, in dry soil. I don't, don't worry about that. But then I don't have a lot of rot problems here. Although I have many more rot problems here than I had in Berlin. Berlin has almost no fungus. It's so dry. It's a really wonderful feature of living in New Mexico. When I, when I first moved out here, uh, I had many, many lithops rot, like lithops uh, schwannesii. It rotted like mad. It, it was so used to New Mexico conditions and so unused to California rot organisms that it had trouble. Anyway, you, you, maybe you dry the plant off for a week. You certainly don't water it for a week or two. Uh, in fact, you can let this cutting get pretty shriveled. But eventually, it will send out a root on its own, even if you don't water it at all. There'll, there'll be some sort of stubby, rather bushy looking roots. They're, they're kind of dry and, and, and thick uh, and they will start rooting and then you can water it cautiously. And within, I would say within a month, every lithops, every conophytum is gonna root. Now the, the best time to do that, well, in the case of the conophytums, I'd say the best time is early September to middle of October when they're obviously cracking out anyway and they're ready to go. Uh, in the case of lithops, I prefer to do it. Um, uh, well, I hadn't. I actually hadn't done it much until I had. I had had a, a visitor volunteer in in June who was right behind us. I think he's hiding now. Uh, that's Oaks Austin, and he said, "Why don't you chop this old nasty cluster of lithops?" And I said, "Oh, because it's an old nasty cluster of lithops. I like to keep it as a, you know, as as venerable specimen." And so he chopped it up. Uh, I didn't have the nerve. He just chopped the thing into 20 pieces. In fact, the one he chopped was Ed Storms' old Atsenia aquamarine. And all those heads rooted, they all flowered like mad. And that was done very late June. So that, that's a good time to do it. I wouldn't want to do it so much now because lithops are essentially, you know, they're flowering now. They're starting to prepare the new leaves. I, you probably could root them, but I wouldn't want to try. It's, it's too, too late in the year. The days are too short and it's too cold. So I, I would wait until April if, if I were doing that. Uh, unless it's a case of desperation, then you could do it any time you know, rather than lose a plant. Number of questions on soil media. Mm. I mean, what do I use or? Right, what, what do you recommend? Uh, well, what I use and what I recommend are two different things. Um, what I would love to use is some ideal soil mixture I cannot get. And I don't know if it exists on this earth. Um, I've tried everything, I have to say. Well, so I'll tell you what I actually use. I use miracle Grow if I can plug a brand. They're not paying me. Uh, miracle Grow with Aquacore, which is getting worse every year. It gets worse every six months, like all commercial mixes. They start out good. Super Soil used to be good 40 years ago. That's horrible now. miracle Grow was really good about 25 years ago. Then they started adding logs to it, you know, un un uncomposted things. So you sift out the logs, you, you can do that. Anyway, I use maybe a third miracle Grow, uh, maybe a third uh, white matter, which could be a combination of perlite and pumice, one or the other. They have different properties, but you can use them together. And then a uh, coarse sand. Now this the kind of sand you can get is, 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 is quite interesting. Uh, I used to, when I lived in Santa Cruz, I used to go out Ill illicitly, to the Santa Cruz River and dig up a little bit from the edge of the river. Now that was of course strictly illegal. I never got caught. I was only taking a quarter at a time. I had a small collection in those days, but I loved my river sand. It was sharp, and had little bits of humus in it. It was obviously very good for seedlings. Anyway, I, I like sharp sand. You can, you can even get it at Home Depot. They call it paver sand. Uh, so at, at, the, at the crudest, you can take miracle Grow perlite and, and uh, Home Depot sand and create a perfectly fine mix. You can add a little charcoal if you like, um, but people who say sand won't work are crazy. Uh, people who say all pumice works are also crazy. Uh, I can tell a pumice plant 10 feet away. I hate all pumice plants, they look horrible. Um, pardon, pardon me to the, the, you people who love pumice. I understand why you do, but I, I hate it. Uh, I think the roots are no good. But any, anyway, um, the other thing you have to say about soil mix is everybody has something that works. Like everybody has a brownie recipe that works. It's not yours, but it actually ends up with a tasty brownie, you know, and you get used to it too. You get used to your own defects, of course. Um, anyway, it's, it's not complicated. I mean, if you have a difficult mesin, you can add some more pumice, like the Van Heerdia primosia, 
which is highly crack prone. It's not rot prone, but it's highly crack prone. That's in half pumice. It's the only plant I do that with because I, I don't want to overwater it. And you could see that in, the, in, that, in that photo, there was not a single crack. So I, yeah, I've done something right or something natural anyway. But also, if you, if you can get oak leaf mold, use oak leaf mold. It's wonderful stuff. Um, you may remember, real old timers remember that Johnson's used to sell oak leaf mold in, in the 50s and 60s. You could get a bag of what he called sclerophyllous oak leaf mold. I think it was $6. It was worth every penny. It was really good. No, nobody sells such a thing these days. And maybe people make their own. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm too lazy, but I, I wish I had it. Anyway, uh, that maybe answers that question. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. This just a personal question is I noticed there was a mix of terracotta and plastic pots in your picture. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a preference between one or two, or is it just whatever you have on hand? I have a list kind of economic preference. I would love to have terracotta for everything, but I have, you may not have heard, I have about probably 250,000 plants, an absurd number of plants you know, many in collective plastic pods because it's practical. If I had everything in a beautiful terracotta plant, I would be, I would have to be a rich person to start with. And I'll also spend more time watering, but oh, for sure, if, if I had a choice, I'd use terracotta. It's, it's beautiful, it's not plastic, it's not ugly, it doesn't break in the same way. Uh, they like it, they like the fact that the pot is breathing. You notice that Van Heerde Promosia was also in a terracotta pot. Yeah, that's why I thought of it. Yes, if for, for precisely that reason. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if you have a preference, I mean, if you, if you have a choice, go for terracotta. Uh, I'd say across the board. And, and if you have kind of items, you can use even, you know, you can use uh, glazed pots. They'll, they'll handle it. The lithops will get too fat, I would say, unless it's a big pot with a whole lot of drainage. Now, obviously, you can do that if you've got a show plant, that, that's fine too. But I mean, I, one reason I don't show is because I have nice plants in ugly pots. And I've, I've never, had the discipline to correct that problem. I mean, they're, they're ugly pots. I mean, one year I showed a beautiful plant in an ugly pot and an ugly plant in a beautiful pot and the ugly plant won. And I, I was astonished, you know, but, and, and the, the muria did not win. I mean, it, was, it was ridiculous. So I stopped showing, but anyway, I, I you know, nothing, nothing against using nice pots. They're, they're wonderful. It's, it's all art form in itself. So don't go that way, it's fine. Stephen, there's also the question if lithops can be tissue cultured. Uh, yes, it, they can be. They, they have been. Um, I, don't, I don't know why one would do it. I mean, one of the things that saved lithops to the extent that lithops have been saved is that their seed production is so fertile and so easy and the coals did such a good job of it over many, many, many years that, you know, unless it's some special marvelous clone, uh, you know, some super thing, um, maybe that exists, but I, I haven't seen one that I thought, oh, that has to be tissue cultured. M maybe, maybe you have, I, I, I don't know. But yeah, it can be done and conifidums can be done too. Although it's even funnier in the way of conifidums because conifidums divide so well, typically, you know, they make big clusters. Uh, you, you, can, you can get 50 conifidums in a year and you can take 50 and in 10 years, you could make 5,000. They're, they're quick really, once they divide. There's something from Keith Green, uh, a request oh, yeah. forwarding from Noreen Cole that coal numbers should no longer be used. Oh, I, I, I've agreed with that for 30 years. I, I, I thought it was always a, a, a mistake. Uh, well, a mistake is not quite fair. Um, at Mesa Garden, Steve and I began, we would say uh, C1, uh, XC1 or, or F2, because what we were doing, we were pollinating coal seedlings, which were produced from coal plants, but there's already two levels of indirection there. And even if we were perfect, we certainly tried to be perfect and the wind never bothered us and thrips never got there and any of that problem, uh, the level of guarantee gets lesser and lesser. And also the level of manipulation because people like me you know, wicked or not, uh, you know, we, we like to favor our red C259s. Now, after I have four generations of C259 and made it bright red, is that C259 anyway? 
not not quite. Although in Noreen's original tray, you could certainly have found a plant corresponding to that. It was the same with Cafe au lait. You remember the, the beautiful uh, Gacilla de Luniata that, that Noreen had one wonderful plant that had the white islands, like creamy islands on, 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 on coffee. And she gave me a fruit from that plant. That's how I got my original Cafe au lait. And I began breeding it, but I found it was not very stable. I get plain ones, I get beautiful ones, I get dark ones, I get light ones. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that is now, unfortunately, in a way divorced from, from coal numbers. Um, it's a rather different case, I think, with conifidans because they've been primarily propagated, well, not primarily, but to a large extent, uh, by cuttings. So I still have any Brown's conifidan precox. Now that's, that's as genuine as it ever was the collecting number is still valid. There's no no problem, unless I've screwed up the label. That's 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 different. Now, if if Noreen and Des's lithops had been propagated as cuttings, uh, which they did to a very small extent, uh, let's say from 1970 onwards. Now, if if anybody had the facilities to do that, you could have also propagated those lithops pure as a driven snow, not from capsules but from cuttings. It would have been possible to do that. And then we would have the situation analogous to that in Conifatum, but we don't, and, and we never will. Uh, the substitute in a way has been people collecting wild lithop seeds and then growing those. And I, I have to admit, a couple of my favorite lithops are from seeds I collected in the wild. Um, and not, not the plant, I, I collected, I think three lithops plants ever, uh, but lithop seeds I've probably collected, I don't know, 50 pods in my wicked life. And, and I even had permits to do that. Um, but um, there, there's something about the lithops raised from a wild capsule that is uh, enticingly variable. And, and it's variable because I know nature did it, not me. And there's something, it's the same with cactus. I'm sure you raised a collected a kind of serious seed. And, ooh, what, what surprise is here? It's not a mistake I made. It's some wonderful natural combination. So that's a little different, I would say. But yeah, I think Noreen is absolutely right. Um, unfortunately, because that's the main way of telling these things apart, you know, in, in terms of locality, you could also ask how much relevance the number 259 has to the map. Uh, it tells us how far south it is. And it, it therefore gives us part of a distribution scheme. The, the northern lithops full rise do not look like C259. I, I think that's fair to say. Uh, I, I wouldn't confuse them, but I might confuse one. You know, an extreme northerner. There's a question here that I'd love to hear your answer. What are the differences between conifidums and lithops taxonomically? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, it's funny. Yeah, I used to get that question when I first started giving lectures uh, for CSSA, which was almost 40 years ago. I was fantastically, I'm still a horribly nervous person, but in those days I was frightful. I, I could not stand to speak in public, but people would ask me that question all the time, so I was prepared for it. Um, but botanically, the answer has become a little more complicated because it used to be said that conifidums had, had bracts, you know, little sort of attachments to the floral envelope, and lithops didn't, and that was the fundamental difference. And then Heidi Hartman decided, well, actually, a lithops is just a big pair of bracts. It has bracts too. It's just a, you know, bracts enclosing a flower. And then the next year, it's another set of bracts enclosing the flower. Now that is a funny technical distinction, but um, there's another way to put it. You could say that you know, lithops make great big clusters and conified them. Uh, lithops don't make great big clusters and conified them do. Uh, lithops grow in the summer and lithops grow in the winter, which is true. They have very similar cotyledons you know, in a way. So that, that's confusing. Uh, the same kind of architecture, a little cylinder with a little dimple in the middle. Um, uh, there are no purple flowered lithops apart from Rose of Texas. There's half the genus of conifidum is, is purple. There are no nocturnal uh, lithops. It's interesting they didn't go in that direction. I've always wondered that. There are no hairy lithops. Of course, there are plenty of hairy conifidums. We saw one today, but there's plenty more. But lithops never went in that direction. Um, on the other hand, there are no conifidums with red warts like Lithos verruculosa. So there's, they, they went in different lines. They very often occur together. Um, and despite what I said before, I tend to think of, uh, of conifidums as essentially winter area plants and 
Lithops is summer area plants, namely Namibia. Uh, that's still largely true, I would say. Uh, um, and also they smell different. Uh, the flowers smell profoundly different. And Lithops flowers are generally much bigger, um, but similar architecture. Uh, the other, uh, well, the other thing which is critical in all this is that if you dissected Lithops flower, it would fall apart. The petals are not attached to each other. You dissect a, lith a conifatum flower and you find that there's a, the tube is grown together making a cylinder. Uh, so you, you, you can't really confuse them. On the other hand, of course, you will guess there are a couple of which violate that rule. You know, all, all the rules get violated one way or the other. Is there a single trait to separate them? A single trait. I'm sure there is, and I'm probably too distracted at the moment to think of it. But maybe somebody else, Matt Opal will tell us. Well, Matt, Matt, where are you? Here, uh, before, let me inter inter interject something really quick here, and this should make Stephen ha uh, happier. I'm going to share his slide here. And uh, apparently you still can buy oak leaf. Uh, wow. Here. <laughs> and, and they uh, have, I see they have bulk orders. Yep. Wow. Um, L okay. Was it LCM or LGM? Is LG that it looks like LGM to me. Uh, yeah. Okay, anyway, just for anybody who's... <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Who's anyone's in, interested here? Uh, okay, well, if, if that corporation gets 300 new um, applicants today, I, I will be happy because that, that's, that's a noble service, I'm sure. Oak Leaf Mode is really good. And the older, the better. I have to say that. But that that's nice to know. Uh, one, one question here is, do um, Lithops and Conophytum do better planted singly in the pot or do they do better in a community pot? That's a very interesting question. Um, if you're talking about horticultural perfection, that is show type perfection, it's undoubtedly better in a single pot. You have, you know, control. I mean, to the extent that you have control at all, which is a, an illusion, the plant's gonna do part of what it wants to do no matter what. But if you have, most of my pots are collective. I have 12 or 16 lithops or conos in a pot, which is stupid. I do it for ease of pollination and to save space but it means that somebody in that pot is going to be starved. Somebody's going to be neglected. Some, some pig of a plant is going to take half the root space. It's, it's going to happen unless you give them all the same mother with my inbred things, and then they all have the same defect, but that's another way to do it. But typically you're going to get a better looking plant with more divisions, more color, more flowers, a single lithos pot in a four inch pot, a single condo in a three inch pot, let's say. Uh, they, they just now do they like company? I'm, I'm not very sent. I am actually terribly sentimental. Of course, they like company. They're they're amorous. We, we know they're amorous. Are they better amorous in separate pots or in the same bed? That's a question you have to ask television in 1950 when people could not be shown that way. <laughs> and certainly not kind of items. I mean, good Lord. What, what they might get up to at night when they're not supervised is horrible. horrible. I, I just hesitate to think, but I'll take off my glasses so I can't think. But anyway, yeah. Um, on the other hand, they look really nice if you have, let's say, four lithops in a four and a half inch pot, you know, spaced out. And they can stay that way pretty well for 10 years. And then the argument that they're crowding each other is false. Um, they fill it, you know, I mean, and also they look beautiful as a set, uh, as a semi-match set. I have to say, I, I, I actually like my mixed pots, but I tend to regret them. Um, uh, yesterday, my friend Oaks is back and he's helping me th this week and we were feeding things and we were noticing how many corners of pots were neglected, <laughs> you know, cause the, this pot was, this plant was fine, but the other one in the corner was not happy, you know? So we soaked it. We gave it a witch dunking, you know, a real, real soak. Uh, and that'll help, but better to have them single, I think uh, on the whole. More questions? Looks like the questions are coming in here. I, ha I have a question. I know that uh, conophytums don't have, like I've been told, I should say, mm. that conophytums don't have an off switch when it comes to absorbing water. Um, so mm. is it important to have a plant in a pot that's small, if it's just a small plant, mm. or, or a small plant in a big pot by itself? Uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. First of all, tell me a plant which does have an off switch. I, I don't know. I don't uh, are, are there any plants with off switches is what I'm getting at. 
I mean, who, who is who has that degree of self restraint among other humans or guinea pigs or, or plants? I, I don't know. My my guinea pigs will stop eating at a certain point, but the conifidums no, they'll, they'll keep on absorbing. Uh, therefore, you limit the amount of that which is absorbable for, for sure. Um, and if you if you end up oversaturating a pot, you're going to pay a price. The plant probably isn't going to rot; it's just going to split like mad and have those Frankenstein scars, which are horrible, but they only last a year. Um, uh, but typically, I have if I had a single kind of phytum, it would be in a small pot, yeah. Uh, and then I can't overdo it to a certain extent, uh, I would say. But on the other hand, I almost never water something um, deeply twice in a row. I just just don't do it. I'm a very I'm I, I water too little to begin with because um, I'm too afraid of things splitting and rotting, uh, which is a vice in a way, but uh, maybe a useful vice, but it's still a vice. Um, so my plants don't usually split, but I would never deep soak a lithops twice within uh, two months. I, I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, they, they've got two good resources for that. You know, so. What about um, chromosome counts and conophytums and lithops? We have a question for that, and I wondered that myself. Are they... Has, has it been done? Is it known, or are they different? Yeah, uh, it's, it's been done. Uh, the conophytums... Uh, were counted almost, well, the, the, the main counter was Matt Opal. I think he's probably with us somewhere. Uh, I hired him to, to, to count the chromosomes. Um, and he was a grad student at the time. And I hope he was happy for the tiny bit of income I gave him because I wanted to publish the, the uh, counts in my first kind of fight book, figuring that would make it look more respectable, which was true. Um, my second book was the unrespectable one. The first one was the respectable one. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so they're all recorded there. But on the other hand, um, Matt didn't have the time and I didn't have the resources to uh, what should have been done was to compare multiple populations of several cases. For example, we found that Confidum subfenestratum, the one I showed you that had the, the nice X marking, uh, that is a diploid and a polyploid. We found both counts and there were previous counts of that as well, because there were some counts done in the 40s. A, a few selected species. Uh, you, you may remember there were the gibbiums were counted in the 1940s during the Nazi era. There, there are some Nazi <laughs> gibbium counts, which by Mr. Wolf, and, and they got a strange bit of publicity because it, it's so so bizarre to think that people were doing botanical research in Nazi Germany and the Berlin Philharmonic was playing Beethoven during the Second World War until until the end. It's horrible. Yeah, but there was legitimate botanical research being done. And it was on gabayums. It wasn't on lithops, but they did a little other work. And then there was some work done in Stellenbosch, too, at about the same period. So, yeah, th those counts are pretty well done. Uh, the lithops counts, I actually don't know much about that. Um, Stephen? Yeah. I've invited Matt to be a panelist, so he's, oh, he's gone. Hello, Matt. I can't see. Oh, oh. Hi, Steve. Hi, hello, hello. Wow, you, you appear. By, by what magic have you... Appeared. I mean, well, the, <laughs> see, the thing is, the window is now widened. Could could we fractal it and make two hundred people? No, no, but nine people. No, just we have we have we met. So well, maybe Matt. I love Matt. I love it. Yes. Maybe Matt can maybe Matt can answer, answer that question. Yeah, About he's invited us to dinner. Yeah, you know, the the majority of conophytums have a chromosome number of two uh, n is eighteen. Um, there are tetraploids, though. There are conophytums with 36 chromosomes. Um, those are sort of scattered around the conophytum family tree, it seems like, but if, you know, a few things like conophytum flavum, uh, concavum, as I recall, or tetraploid. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Luthier, you remember. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's funny. Sort yeah. of here and there among conophytums. It's not like there's a group of conophytums that are all tetraploid. And it's also not like it's obvious. You know, you think, oh, this is a big, big girl. It's going to be a, a right. tetraploid. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I, I always thought the burger I would, ought to be a tetraploid or a super tetraploid because it's so buxom, but it's not. In lithops, Matt? I haven't done any lithops myself. As I recall, I think they're all uh, 18 chromosomes. I think they're all diploid. I might be wrong about that. I, I think I think Heidi oh. implied that, or maybe you actually even said that. I could look that up quickly. Uh, some some of them did that work at some point, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Rob Wallace, of course, did much more with the tenoniferous idioblasts, and that and that 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 became the fashion. But I th yeah, they're probably all diploid, and therefore boring, unlike conifidus. But well, not boring, but simple. 
So the chromosome counts would not be a barrier to cross uh, generic uh, hybrids then? No, you mean within lithops or within conifidum or? Between conifidum and lithops. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, I, I have done those hybrids and they're terribly ugly and weak. Um, <laughs> I haven't got a single strong one unless lithops tanikiana is in fact one of them, as I strongly suspect it is. But I haven't been able to replicate it, and nobody else, to my knowledge, has either. So hmm. it'd be nice. That would be nice proof if, if it happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, as you say, you can cross lithops and argyrodermis. So why not lithops and conifidum or whatever? Or okay. Gabayas, whatever. Looks like the questions keep coming in here. Uh, Irvin, or anybody seen any Yeah, Car Carol asked, uh, what is your suggestion? to do with the thousands of confiscated conifidums and lithops. Uh, what, do you, what do you want to, what well, can we do since we can't put them back in nature? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot. It, I mean, it, it upsets me on several levels, uh, partly because when I was working at Carew Garden, I got involved in a confiscated shipment of Worthia vitabergensis, you know, 772 plants, I think it was. And the issue arose, are we going to repot these in, in, in the Ruinac Pass? It's impossible. It's between quartz plates. You can't do it. So did Kirsten Bosch want to take them? No, Kirsten Bosch did not want to take them. Should Carew Garden keep them? That's what I said. Yeah, keep them in, in 10 trays and pollinate them forever and supply the world with what they're bitter against the seed. And it didn't quite happen. But anyway, um, they would have to all be potted up in trays. Uh, I, th I think, and they would have to be in an area of at least minimum shelter because I can't think of any place in South Africa where they could be tended outside. They would need at the very least shade cloth and probably fiberglass protection too. Um, on the other hand, you could get an awful lot of conifidums in a, in a 12 by 18 tray, clearly. But the tragic numbers indicate a tragic number of trays. Um, the, the only even conceivable saving grace for any of that would be that on those collected plants would be a vast seed supply, which could then be added to the Kirstenbach seed list and dominate the world with conifidum concavum seed. Um, I can think of no other good to come from this misfortune. Um, but yeah, they, they can't be they can't be replaced in nature. I don't think. Uh, they, they, Roy Early did some replanting of, of two texts in, in lithops, but that was very careful preparation. That was planned. Uh, that was monitored. They were watered. They're still monitored. Uh, I think it's a successful experiment. But you can't do that with raw plants, which have been butchered two months before, and then what do you, what do you do with them? Um, they they dried out. And, and, you know, I've, I've certainly established collected cuttings, you know, because my, my permit, by the way, allowed me three whole plants or cuttings. And I usually took cuttings and I would take cuttings back in the States that were already two months desiccated and they're, they're difficult to revive. And of course, it was the wrong hemisphere. So that makes it even worse. They, they confidants hate movement. Lithops hate movement. It's, it's, it's a dreadful thing to do. It's, it's cruel. It's, it's vegetable cruelty. And to me, vegetable cruelty is absolutely no different than animal cruelty. I, I think I don't even think plants and animals are different. To tell you the truth, it's the same thing. Uh, equally sensitive, wonderful things. And uh, they don't deserve to be butchered. Although I, I have to admit, I, I do eat eggs. Funny. Uh, so I'm a hypocritical vegetarian but anyway uh no you, you should not dig up these beautiful plants I and mean, it's, it's, it's a hideous thing to do a, a stupid thing to do too and an unnecessary thing to do what else do you want but I, i'm sorry it has been done and I, I i agree the plants have to be rescued to the extent possible but this is a lot of space uh, obviously a lot of numbers maybe you could farm it out to different people you know find a hundred conified and volunteers in the in the republic um there must be at least 20. I, I was on a couple of rescue missions myself, you know, rescue this Dactylops, well, not, not Dactylopsis, uh, Dracophilus. And, and who, who wants to house 20 Dracophilus? Would you like to have 20 Dracophilus? They're lovely plants. Only take your big tray you know, and find your 10 neighbors to do it too. 
I, I was on a quartz, uh, Rose Quartz Mountain, which was being destroyed. And I was invited to take all the Hora the Atesolata that I wanted, which was none. I took six. It was the piggiest collection I ever made in my life. I still have them, but I shouldn't have them. I never had a permit for Hora the Atesolata, but nobody had a permit. Well, I suppose the owner had the permit to dig up the quartz mountain. It's gone now. And so were the Kanos and the optimal films and Lithops and the Horthias were living on that mountain, unfortunately. That's a downer. Let's see, uh, we have maybe, uh, we have lots of questions in the queue here. Uh, let's, let's maybe do two more. Stephen, you have time maybe for two more? I have two more, yeah. Oh God, it's 11.33, how'd that happen? Well, wow, okay. I, I didn't look at my clock, you see, so. Okay. Uh, one Rod here that maybe Jackson, you have one. Yeah, one here that I see a couple people have asked is, um, do you have any recommendations on growing the lithops, codophytums, and other mesums from seed um, as part of your breeding work? Oh, uh, everybody should do that, um, and right away. Um, you mean recommendation how to start, or, or... yeah, like um, <laughs> what kind of setup you use, what kind of soil, um, what time of year, etc. Well, um, I can only tell you what I prefer to do. Um, I prefer to sow lithops in the summer when it's nice and toasty, because I think that's when they, they respond the best and they certainly grow the fastest. So, and a toasty here means July. It's not June. You know, we have, we actually have cold Junes with a lot of fog. Now in other places, maybe Ohio, maybe June is the hottest, I don't know. But anyway, you want to start them on long days. Let's put it that way, long, warm days. Now, you don't want to do that with conifidum, although I've been doing experiments about that. And certain conifidums do fine with long day sowing. Some do better. Conifidum burgeri does just fine with the July sowing. But then it's this thunder shower plant and it, it gets summer showers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's okay that way, uh, just like Dinaranthus. But otherwise, uh, conifidums you want to do when it's cooler when the days are shorter. Now you can either do it in October, in which case your, your seedlings are gonna be reaching some kind of size when the days are shortest and most miserable, or you can do it in January, which is what some English people do. And then they come into some kind of size in March and April, and then they go dormant. Or you can try to keep them going the whole entire first year, which, which is quite possible if you give them enough shade and enough water. In other words, the, the chain, you know, as, as I think everybody knows here, Lithops and conifidums, they basically change their skins once a year. They flower once a year. They have a strictly annual cycle. There's maybe two partial exceptions to that. And, and even that's kind of difficult. Uh, that means that the seedlings, you would think, would also have one year cycle, but that's not true. Uh, if, if the seedlings get enough water, they can have two or three cycles during the first year and they'll be perfectly fine. And they sort it out later. And they may even be a little messy the first year. You're allowed to split leaves when they're you know, six months old. They're, they're, it's inevitable. Uh, they're, they're not going to be as neat as you would like. If you want them terribly neat, you're going to have very slow lithops. That's just, just the way it is. But uh, as for soil mix, I basically use a baby version of the same mix we talked about. You just sift it more. And, and you can add a little more perlite because you want a little more airy mix because you, your, your great danger is rotting at that point. Um, and if, if you have rotted the seedlings, you have watered too much. I mean, that is proof. Um, now you may try to combat that with one or another fungicide, but you still watered too much. They're still going to grow in a lopsided way. So you don't want to get to that point in, in my opinion. Um, and the other thing is that you, I, I cover the seeds for the first maybe 10 days, but then after that, I give them fresh air uh, pretty much no matter what. Um, because I, I, I actually don't use fungicide. I've been scared of it since I was a hippie. I'm still a hippie. But um, when, they, when they first discovered that um, rooting powder had carcinogens, and this is 1976 or something, I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to touch that stuff. And I, and I didn't, and I don't, because I, I regard rotting as, as God's judgment on you. You, you have watered too much. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. It's true. I'm very puritanical, you know. Um, in my way, yeah, yeah you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't let. You, you should let them get that wet to germinate, but you shouldn't let them that wet to try to grow. That that's a different matter. Germination is is, is a separate. Right. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah th think of it that way. You can soak all you like for four days, but no more. 
Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe one more question. Okay. I have another one here. That's okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, it says, can you talk about the corky covering of lithops roots that can develop over time? It, is it good to remove it when we're potting? Um, that's an interesting question. It, it does, I mean, it's, it's a mark of maturity. The older it gets, the corkier and tougher it gets. Now, therefore, uh, in theory, the more difficult it gets for the stem to make a new, you know, new root for, for the new season. In other words, when you, let's put it this way, when you, when you water conifitums, which have quite thin roots, you water them once in October and magically they, they, they make new roots in a day. You can actually watch it. You, you can soak them and you can see it growing. That's not true with lithops. Lithops, you would have to soak it for a week before it would penetrate that corky bark. Now I've never done the sort of shaving technique myself. I don't trim them, I don't cut them. But obviously when you, when you divide the plant up, you are <laughs> breaking to the cork in the, in the grossest way possible. And therefore maybe liberating the rooting area, it, it would be true. Um, but I, I've never really worried about that. I mean, it's just, when I start, see, I, I don't start watering the lithops until May, typically. They, they go they're completely dry all, all winter um, because they're absorbing their old, old juices. You know, they don't need any water. Now, if you want to wake them up in May, you can water them once. And you may see some of them don't respond at all. They think, oh, what's happened? Well, what they're trying to break through the cork. Now, if you water them again two weeks later, you probably help them break through the cork a little more. I mean, they, they sense it's there, but it's rather a barrier. They have to have to get through it. Um, but I find that the third watering is going to do it uh, if, if the root is sound. Now, what can also happen is that corky root is also a semi-rotten root. In other words, sometime during the previous fall, it got infected. It's, it's not really very healthy. You can be corky and still sound at the same time. And you, you've, you've seen barks on trees where the tree is healthy or not healthy. I mean, what's, you know, it, it becomes quite obvious. Think of it as a little tree stump. But anyway, I, I don't trim them in that sense usually, well, only if I cut them up. Okay. Stephen, thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, we still have over 300 uh, people uh, watching us here. <laughs> and uh, I know it's, uh, they will stay all day long. And uh, I would say all, all day long too, of course, but I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So uh, let's go through here. Uh, Irving, any last thoughts? Oh, it was excellent. And also there were more on Facebook watching too, Stephen. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jackson, uh, any, any thoughts? Great presentation. Definitely. It's especially with some of the making slides, I kind of have a, a new respect for mass Thames and I'm, uh, looking forward to growing more. Oh, that's, um, it's the most wonderful family on earth. I sound like Disneyland, don't I? Yeah. Yeah. But, but it, it, and it's a big, uh, well, I didn't talk about this, but it's a big family. Yeah. And it's yeah. not just Conos and Lithops. There's, there's a hundred other charms. I mean, really, uh, they've got it. Ron, any last, any last thoughts, Ron? Yeah. Any chance of reprints of your books that are out of print? Uh, well, there is an illegal Chinese reprint. Of, of one, <laughs> I just got it the other day. <laughs> um, and there's, there, there are several knockoff copies as well. Um, the illegal one, well, there's actually there's many, many versions. Um, uh, it's funny, dumpling is in print illegally in China, but it's completely out of print. Um, the conograph was a two and a half thousand, you know, limited edition on purpose. It cannot legally be reprinted without change. Nothing I can do. Um, uh, there were plans, and there may still be plans, to issue another kind of fighting book of which I'd be a, a partial author. Um, this was uh, Andy Young and Chris Rogerson, who really r replaced me as field workers, no, no question about it. Um, I would like to join them, but they have done all the recent work, all the recent significant work, with, well, the Hungarian exception, too. Um, they were talking about doing a book. Uh, Andy got particularly spooked by the... Um, uh, let's call it the gross overpopularity of collected plants. You know, how can we possibly publicize these plants anymore? And how can we mention data and localities without endangering the whole thing? I personally think that market has now collapsed. I maybe just be hopeful and silly. Uh, but I, I would not be as afraid of that as I was six months ago, I, I'd have to say. Uh, but anyway, they, they can't be reprinted. Um, I just, it, I can't do it. In any case, I would want to change them. I mean, there are things I hate in all my books. I mean, 
yeah, that's certainly true. But um, some of them I hate more than others. Put it that way. Because I, yeah, I, I discover new things, and I just decide old ideas are stupid and and or or incomplete. They they didn't make sense. You know, why did I think that? I have to think back. You remember I wrote the Kano book in basically in 1988. That's a long time ago. It was published in '93, but it was well actually. In fact, I wrote it in longhand in 1986 when I had my sabbatical in Kuru Garden. It was a wonderful sabbatical, and that's how I wrote so much. People wonder how do you write so much? I don't write so much at all. I write. I'm terribly so a writer. But I had a whole year to do nothing but write. It was, it was wonderful. Um, I actually got a lot done. And a lot of research, too, because I'd go back and forth to the library at Cape Town, and I'd take the train back to Worcester. Uh, th that's how I did it. People wonder. And this, this is all pre-internet, remember. Uh, <laughs> that, that has changed a lot. Now you can even find on the internet uh, letters from Marie Chauvin, you know, the, 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 the namesake of Confederate Chauvinia. It's, it's all out there. You have to look, but it's there. James, any last thoughts? No, I'm just uh, so impressed by you, sir, and, and your uh, comfort with the cone of items and all that stuff. That it, uh, it's really great. My comfort? I'm I'm nervous as hell. <laughs> <laughs> my, yeah. comfort, my, my comfort with them. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. all it's all externalized. See, I I identify with them. Yeah. And I'm, their their welfare is absolutely critical to mine. I mean, I when I water them, I feel like I'm watering me. Doesn't that sound quaint? But, but it's true. I'm, fe I'm feeding them. I'm feeding me. I, 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 I will say this. I think I know generally what they want. And I feel very bad if I fail to provide that. I, I think that should be true for all our horticulturalists. We don't have to be pigs. We have, we have a choice. I know I sound like a preacher again, but it is true. We can be good or bad, and we can be sensitive or not. And the plants tell us. They absolutely tell us what they want. Once you learn their clues, they're very transparent creatures. They, they tell you exactly what they want. Everybody here knows that, but you don't necessarily have time to obey. Well, that's your fault. You've got too many plants. And then it's obvious with my case. I have thousands of neglected things. It's, it's, it's shameful. Um, I try to do something about it, but anyway, it's within the realm of the possible to understand them and to take good care of them. Whatever your situation happens to be, but as I keep on saying, your situation is not my situation. Your soil is not mine. Your climate is not mine. So, it has to be very individual, but that's also what makes it interesting. Uh, you know, we don't need clones of Steve Hammer or anybody else. We need unclones, you know, so I, I think. But. Hello, Matt. Nice to see you in your domestic environment. Is that, a, is that a Thanksgiving table? Oh, look, look. Oh, hello, hello. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> uh, Petra, any last, any last thoughts? Uh, no, it was a great program, Stephen, and I hope we will get the chance to visit each other, being that close. I, I hope so, yes, and happy Halloween. Very important. Happy, thanks, happy Stephen. Halloween. It's the uh, day of the dead and the living. You know. Matt, thank you for joining us. Any last thoughts? Oh, no problem. It was a fabulous talk. I'm oh, glad to be here. So glad you were able to join uh, us. Uh, and and thanks for, doing, for doing the whole thing. I mean, and also, I, I must thank John again, because without him, I'm hopeless. Take really. Care. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, thank you once again, Stephen. Uh, and uh, uh, this guy, yeah, just give me, there's still, believe it or not, there's two, 272 people still online here. So we'll oh, let you go we, and have, have lunch or dinner and, and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend here. And Gunner, uh, would you tell everyone uh, about how to see the program for the next day or two? Yes. Okay. The program right now, it's, it's still live streaming, it's about two, five minutes behind. But it is on our Facebook page. If you go to the Catches and Suckling Society Facebook page, it will be on uh, on our page until the end of the weekend. Okay? So okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thank you for, for inviting me. And then we'll see you then uh, in two weeks, everyone. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Petra, for joining us. James, okay. Gana, will this be also on YouTube or just on Facebook? Just on Facebook. But uh, yes. But I, I, if you, if you email me, I can send you a copy. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye, -bye folks. Bye. Good to see you, Stephen. By the way, Petra, you do not have to be a member of Facebook to see Facebook videos.